He says, we have such a high priest. This priest is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Have you ever gotten directions from someone that you found very confusing? Maybe it was them. Maybe it was you. Uh, Tara has wanted to strangle me more than a few times for getting directions from someone that get us close to our destination but don't exactly deliver us to the door. If somebody's giving me directions, it's almost never their fault, the reason we don't get there. I listen long enough to where I know we'll be very, very close and I kind of sort of lose interest and I just start nodding and going, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that store. Yeah, that, that turn, yeah. And so we get close and, and again, don't really arrive. Any of, ladies, any of y'all have husbands like that? Are there any other people in the room like that? (laughs) Right. Well, uh, I'm sorry for your spouses, for those of you who suffer with my condition. And, of course, I'm very sorry for Tara. Uh, Y'all have no earthly idea what she has to put up with. Anyway, uh, it's really good when we're used to confusing instructions. Uh, It's very refreshing when we get directions that are clear, simple, and fail-safe. They deliver us to the place that they promise to deliver us to. The writer of Hebrews has been making the point that the Old Testament contained a lot of confusing directions. Not because the directions themselves were confusing confusing per se but because the people who were listening to the instructions were dull the people of israel were a dull people and so they had not been hearing clearly the directions that had been given to them god spoke clearly god spoke good god spoke in a holy way in the law and yet they weren't understanding the things that they were hearing quite often as an answer to this god sends jesus jesus was clear emphatic direction this was always the plan God was not somehow surprised or caught off guard by the people's inability to follow the directions that he had given them he knew because of their human nature because of the inherent uh, depravity of it all he knew that they were going to go awry from the plan and that they would not arrive at the destination that he had given in his instructions Because they were rebels to grace, they would be completely unable to do what his covenant required. And Jesus was the solution to their inability. The solution to their inability. The people who are receiving this letter, the letter to the people of 
uh, this, this Hebrew people, they're receiving this letter and they're being tempted to go back to a set of directions that they had confused and really, really muddled up. They'd gotten it wrong, it seems, from the beginning. They were tempted to dive back into this old system of relating to God when everything about that system pointed towards Jesus, the one who could uh, do the things that they could never do, the ones who could fulfill things in a way they could never hope for. Jesus would be the priest to end all priests. In fact, that could be a tagline, if you will, for the book of Hebrews. Uh, Jesus is better. He's the priest to end all priests. He's the one who could grant us immediate, unfettered access to the very presence of the majesty, the Father himself. In an unveiled kind of way, he could grant us that access. None of the Old Testament priests could ever do anything like that. There was always a veil until Jesus. The point of chapter 8 is that we have this sort of high priest that we've been talking about. This ultimate priest king in Jesus Christ. The first, and I think the major point he makes about Jesus' priesthood, and, and what everything that we talk about this morning is going to kind of funnel towards and support, it, it's the idea that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the majesty. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty. Now, to you and I, this may not mean very much. To me, uh, I like to find a seat because I'm always looking to sit down. Um, I just feel like I'm kind of always tired. But for us, we don't get the full import of this. But to the Jew receiving this letter, this was pretty significant information. Pretty significant information. Um, in the Leviticus series from last year, and I encourage you, if you're new with us and you haven't heard that series, it provides so much context for what we're talking about in Hebrews. We did a three-month series through the book of Leviticus, and in 22 years of preaching, it is my favorite series that I've ever preached. Uh, I absolutely loved the uh, finding the relevance and the significance for a book that old for modern-day people. But in that series, we looked at the work of the high priest on the Day of Atonement in one of those messages. We noted at the time that from morning until night, there was not one single moment during the high priest's day while he was performing his priestly duties, not one single moment where he sat down. He stood up all day long. Now, I don't know if you've ever had one of those days where, you know, the day starts at 5 o'clock in the morning and until 10 o'clock at night, you're, you never sit down. Those are exhausting days. This was incredibly important because it signified that in the old sacrificial system, atonement was never finished. Atonement was never finished. It was never completed, if you will. It would hold everything over until next time. It would placate or pacify for a while, but it was never finished. Jesus, as the high priest, in his work of redemption, has sat down. He did something that the Old Testament high priest never did during his duty. Jesus has been seated in this regard for almost 2,000 years. Seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Now, Jesus' intercessory work, in his intercessory work, we see him to be Standing. There are verses in Scripture that speak of Jesus as standing. And in his intercessory work, he is standing. But in that work, there is no continuation of redemption. That's not what's happening there at all. The intercessory work of Jesus is a remembrance of redemption. It's a remembrance of its completion. It's a remembrance of the time when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary and said, it is finished. So in redemption, Jesus is seated. In intercession, he stands. 
The truth of Christ being seated in redemption is of enormous significance for you and I. It means that we can rest. It means that there is absolutely nothing we are required to do to supplement the work that Jesus once and for all accomplished on the cross of Calvary. It absolves you and I of any sense that we must atone for our bad works by doing good things. Now this is a theme if in many, if not all, of the world's religions in one way or another. There's always a sense in which you need to be making up for the bad stuff. Making up for the bad stuff. If you're honest, I think we can probably admit that sometimes we do that, right? We do bad things to people and then we think the only way to make up for that is by doing good things. We're taking atonement into our own hands. And we're going to sort it out and we're going to reconcile relationships and we're going to do these things. We will atone for our bad works. This morning, sitting in uh, one of the chairs out here, uh, I accosted an individual who uh, had a low country boil last night. Some of you might know who this person is. Had a low country boil with shrimp and corn on the cob and all that good stuff that soaks in that delicious savor, and they did not invite me. And so I am deeply and forever eternally offended. And so what did he do? He tried to atone for his badness. He gave me a hash brown. (laughs) Now, a hash brown will never, never atone for the fact that I didn't get shrimp last night. But he tried, all the same, to atone for his bad work. You see, it's just kind of in us. We're always looking to make right what we've made wrong. And the truth of the cross and the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is now forever seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty means that we do not have to atone for sin he did in a complete and final way. But it's inherent in human nature to think that we can overcome our bad with enough good. When we know that we've been bad to someone, we've got to make it up. We've got to do enough good. We want to put ourselves in a better light with them by erasing bad with the good. Years ago, I had a man in my church who approached me, and he told me after a sermon one Sunday morning, he told me what a crummy neighbor he had been to the people who lived around him for quite a few years. He said that he'd been a really bad neighbor for a long time. He said he'd yelled at their kids for crossing his lawn, for leaving their toys around. He'd left nasty notes with these people about their dogs barking and things like this. He'd even called the cops on them a couple of times whenever a party got a little too loud for his taste. He felt bad about all of this. And in light of the way I had been preaching about loving your neighbor and living on mission, he decided he was going to change. And so he came to me after the service, and he told me he was going to try hard, and I remember he actually used the word, he was going to try hard to atone for all of his crumminess by being a better neighbor. He told me that he, him and his wife were going to bake cookies for everybody on their street that he knew he'd offended and he was going to leave cookies and a note talking about he, how he wanted to be a better neighbor he continued to tell me about all the ideas that he had about being a better neighbor and he finished with thought with a thought like this he hoped that they could forget in time all of the unneighborly things he had done to them i looked at him after he got through and i said Please don't do this. And he looked really shocked. I'm pretty sure he was certain that I was going to pat him on the back and say, that's a great idea. You know know what? You should really do all of those things. And here's a couple of other ideas, things that I've read about in in leadership magazines or whatever. I think he thought I was really going to give him a pat on the back and he looked at me very very shocked and then I asked him with this the shocked look still in his face I said do you believe the gospel and in a shocked way he said well yes 
I said, why then would you live like it is not true? He was completely lost, completely and totally lost. So I asked him again, I said, do you believe that on the cross of Jesus, or on the cross, Jesus atoned for all of your sins? And he said, yes, I, I believe that. I said, all of them? Totally? Completely atoned for? Do you believe that? And he thought harder this time, looked at me harder this time, and he said, yes. I said, why then would you try to redeem yourself? By doing good works for your neighbors. He said, well, I never thought of it that way. And I said, it is that way. It is that way. That's not just the perception. It is that way. When we think that we can make up for bad by doing enough good, it is that way. I said, without meaning to, you would be showing your neighbors a way of living that depends on being good to put yourself right with others. That's not the gospel, I said. It's not the gospel. He said, what should I do then? How can I become a better neighbor? How can I live on mission like you've been preaching and telling me to do? I said, well, you can start the way the gospel starts. I said, go to your neighbors, look them in the face. And confess your sins against them. Confess that you have sinned against their children, that you've sinned against them, that maybe you've called the cops on them. Uh, Tell them the things that you've done wrong. Repent of your sins. Tell them that God has convicted you of your sins against them. Tell them that God has forgiven you of your sins through Jesus' work on the cross and that you want to start living like that's true. Tell them the truth of that means you don't have to live like an angry old coot who gets upset about everything. Confess these things to them. Tell them that since you believe Jesus' redeeming work on your behalf is enough, you don't have to be angry like this anymore. Tell them that you hope in time that they might forgive you for your old ways because you know that you are forgiven by Christ. Tell them that they hope that one day they will be able to see that Jesus is alive in you and you want to be more like him. Tell them also that you might blow it and holler again because you are a continual sinner in need of the daily grace of God for your sins so he looked at me and he said you know admitting to them face to face that i've been so bad is going to be real hard and i said yeah i know that's what that's what we resist about the gospel that's what we resist about the gospel we want to think we can just make up for bad by doing more good we don't want to own our bad We don't want to take responsibility for our bad. We don't want to confess it as sin. But the gospel won't let us do this. And we've got to decide what we're going to be like. Are we going to show our people the gospel of Jesus Christ or try to show them that we're really good people? Which one of those things do you think has the power to save them? That you're a really great guy? You're a really great gal? Or that Jesus Christ alone is able to atone for all of our sins? We often live like Jesus never died, like we have so much ground to make up. You ever feel like that? I mean, come on, be honest. You just got a lot of ground to make up. You had a really bad month last month, and so you got to really work hard to have a better month this month. Last month, I didn't hardly read my Bible. I didn't hardly pray. I didn't tell anybody about Jesus. So this month, I'll read a lot more Bible. I'll pray a lot more. I'll tell five people at work about Jesus. Because we think we have to make up ground. This is why Tim Keller can say that if we are not clinging to the gospel, we will be sliding back into religion 
and all of us tend, the human heart tends toward religion. It tends towards making myself look good by obedience to some standard. Religion teaches that continual atonement for bad deeds is possible by doing enough good deeds. Anytime, listen to this, this is important. Anytime you live as if you can atone for some wrong done to others or to God, then you are failing to believe that Jesus sat down. It is so important to combat religiously motivated good works because they mock the finished work of Jesus Christ. They ultimately mock his death. They insinuate, anytime you're trying to atone for something, it insinuates that Jesus didn't sit down, that redemption isn't finished. There's still something left for you to add. Jesus completed salvation with no contributions from any of us. I hope that you can see how good works meant to atone for bad are an insult to Jesus' work. I'm not, notice I didn't say good work is an insult to Jesus' work. No, not at all. Good work to atone insults the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus and living in the light of what he accomplished in his death and in his powerful resurrection, living in light of that will mean we are far different people. We'll quit yelling at our neighbor so much and his kids for leaving their scooter in the yard and, and, and we won't be irritating people to sit next to in a cubicle at work and we'll be different people because we're living in light of something not because we're trying to make up ground. It's radically different. This is why the Bible is so intimately concerned not with simply what you do but with why you do the things that you do. When I say sometimes we get directions and they're confusing, the Old Testament community of Israel had received God's law. And they had forgotten the weightier matters. The weightier matters were why we do what we do. And they had seen that it was enough simply to check off on their list that I've done the right things. But why they were doing the things that they did mattered an insane amount. The rest of this chapter, chapter 8, is making a case for seeing Jesus as seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. The text in front of us is making the case that Jesus came to bring a better way to draw near to God. That was the phrasing he used in chapter 7. This drawing near to God. He says those priests, the Levitical priests in the old sacrificial system, they could never help people draw near to God. Jesus alone could accomplish that. And so this text is making the case that salvation has once and for all been accomplished. There was no sense derived from the old covenant that salvation was accomplished. It was always in limbo. There was always more to be done, always more sacrifices to be offered. But this better way is brought to us by better promises from God, our text says. The better way was not supported by the promises of people to God. Every time, there were times throughout the Israel's history that they would gather together, the law would be read, and they would recommit themselves to God. They would read it and say, we will do all of these things. How did that always end? Disastrously. 
every time they recommitted themselves to be better, do better, atone for their bad, every time they did this, it would always end disastrously. In fact, it would get so bad that God would get so fed up at their failure to keep their promises that he would allow other nations, but he planned for other nations more sinful than they were to overrun them and drag them off into captivity. These times were called the exile. One of the greatest prophets of Israel was prophesying during one of these invasions and the exile of the people. His name was Jeremiah. Jeremiah is quoted extensively in this passage here in Hebrews chapter 8. All of this language about the new covenant, that's, that's from Jeremiah. He'd been God's mouthpiece. He was promising Israel a new covenant since the old ones simply couldn't help them like they needed. The old covenant was so much based on whether or not they will do what they say they will do and they never would. Because the covenant of law that God made with the people through the tablets on Sinai was a conditional covenant. God said, if you do this, then I will bless you. If you disobey, then I will curse you. There were conditions to be met. Not like the covenant with Abraham. Where God alone made promises and would carry through and fulfill everything he had promised to Abraham. So the people needed a new covenant. And Jeremiah told them one was coming. But his promises went unheeded. The whole nation should have been looking for God to do some great and extraordinary thing. Something that was radically going to reorder the way of relating to God. That's what they should have been looking for. But when the way of that reordering appeared, they killed him. You see, Israel had um, professionals in the Old Testament. They were professionals. They knew it backwards and forwards. Many of them, by the time they were 13 years old, could recite verbatim the first five books of the Bible. They knew the law. They knew Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel, all of the minor prophets. They knew them backwards and forwards. And yet they missed the promises of God in the new covenant when he arrived. What did the professionals do? They they kept understanding the Old Testament to mean they should try harder than before. That they should be more meticulous in their observance of God's laws. God's laws. So what did they do? They created more laws. As if as if the Old Testament isn't enough, they created more. It's like when they read Jeremiah, they couldn't see the beautiful promise right in front of them. And the truth is, we're not very much different than they are. Sometimes it's easy to read about these guys and go, man, how were they so dull? And then we hear the writer of Hebrews saying to people like us, oh, ye who are dull of hearing. We're in the new covenant, but we often read the words of Jesus and the words of the disciples, and all we can see is do this and this and this, and don't do this and this and this. That's to miss the forest for the trees in the most tragic of ways. It's the greatest of ironies to see the rest giver as if he's the task master. is the wrong way of understanding God's word. When we read the new covenant in terms of what we must do, we fail to see the boldest, most emphatic words in the Bible are about what God has done through his son Jesus. When we make the Bible about what we must do rather than what God has done, we've become no different than the Pharisees. No different at all. 
Jesus would establish something so radical that our hearts could finally rest in him. Jeremiah says his word would be written on our hearts. We can know him at the deepest and most intimate level. There's no more veil separating us at all like those in the Old Covenant. In this new covenant, God says, according to Jeremiah, quoted here in Hebrews, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now that, that's an interesting text. Because if you remember back, if you were here for the Leviticus series, Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12, that's God's promise. This whole system that God had devised was so that, so that they would be his God, or they would be his people, and he would be their God. So this is an echo from the first covenant. And yet it's included in the new covenant, which just goes to show that God's purposes in the old covenant were always to flow into its fulfillment in the new. Always. He takes an old covenant promise and weaves it into the new covenant, basically saying the old covenant could never do this, the new covenant will. So why was the new covenant needed if the same result of being God's people is accomplished by both covenants? Well, the first covenant couldn't accomplish it. It couldn't accomplish it. The point of this text is that the Old Covenant could not, in fact, achieve the reality that they would be his people and he would be their God. This is why verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 8 says, uh, uh, and verse 8 of Hebrews 8 says that the Old Covenant had a catastrophic fault. It had a fault, a major, significant fault. This fault was that people could not draw near to God through obedience to the law. Paul says this, doesn't he? Romans chapter 3, no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. Justified is to draw near to God, is to be accepted by God, to be in his presence behind the veil where we can see him face to face. The law can't do that. By living under the law, they could only see how far away from him that they truly were. Imagine for a moment that you're following signs to a desired destination. You're walking with hope that you can arrive at this destination soon. At some point, though, you arrive at a cliff. There's a 500-foot drop, and the other side is so far that you could never, ever get to. Let's say it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of feet across. You get to that cliff and you realize that certain death awaits the person who tries to follow the signs that point across the cliff. If you were to just, okay, well, I'm just going to keep following the signs. I'm going to walk by faith off the end of this cliff. Um, the, the bottom is filled with all the bones of people who've tried. We can see the other side. It's beautiful. We want it. It's definitely the destination that we want. But there's no way to get there. No way. The signs are of no help at all at this point. Until a bridge is laid. From the other side, a bridge extends all the way across the divide. It's solid and it's secure and it's the only one. In the old covenant, the new covenant was promised. The new covenant would be inaugurated through the building of the bridge. Jesus Christ would lay himself down for his people, his church. He would build a bridge across the divide by giving up himself, by leaving the glory of heaven and becoming and taking the form of a bondservant. To humbly consider our interests as greater than his own. Jesus himself would become the bridge. You see, the signs, the signs could only get us so far. The signs could only bring you to the edge of the cliff, but you can't get over. The signs of the old covenant could only take people so far. Only the new covenant 
could deliver us to the destination of intimate relationship with God. Isaiah 53 tells us all about the bridge. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt... He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. This was a new covenant promise in old covenant times. This was a completed atonement. That was promised. A completed atonement. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The atonement to end all of our attempts to atone for all of our wretched living. To atone for all of our selfishness. You see, Old Covenant times were dominated by a religious understanding. Old Covenant times were dominated by a religious understanding. There's only one religion, only one religion that was actually ordained by God. It was called good and holy. The religion of the Jewish people given in the law was ordained by God. But get this, it was created with a fault for a purpose. It was created with a fault for a purpose. Every religion has faults because they cannot ultimately deliver what they promise. There are signs pointing to a destination that you got a cliff to cross before you get there. And none of us can. The fault of religion, the fault of this God-ordained religion, is that it couldn't ultimately deliver what it pointed to, but it can It can deliver us to a Savior. The Old Covenant system could not deliver us to glory, but it can deliver us to a Savior. All of the signs can deliver us to the bridge, but the bridge carries us across. Uh, let me tell you what the bridge does. When you, when you arrive at that point, point on the cliff, all, all of your striving and all of your best efforts have gotten you nowhere and you realize there's no way that you can get across this divide. And then the bridge appears. It makes any attempts to try to jump across seem ludicrous, doesn't it? When you see the bridge, safe and sturdy and solid, it makes any other attempts to get to the other side look absolutely ridiculous. This is why verse 13 of Hebrews 8 says that Jesus has made the old covenant with all of its signs obsolete. Obsolete. Obsolete doesn't mean that it has no significance, but that its significance exists only as a pointer to the bridge. The bridge will get us to the destination. Paul is making this same point in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 10 he says, Indeed, in this case, what once had glory, he's referring to the covenant of the law, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. In the Old Covenant, all of those signs, all of those pointers, they were glorious until the glory showed up. And it radically dimmed the glory of all those signs. And they are coming to an end. They are passing away. So we can see, right, that Jesus isn't propping up a religious system. 
He is not one more in a long line of priests who continually stands to make atonement that's never finalized. I think that's what people, so many people around the world think today. They think that when they are rejecting Jesus, we've talked about this a lot in the past few weeks, they think that when they are rejecting Jesus that they are rejecting religion. They think that when they reject Jesus, they're rejecting this guy who came along to prop up a religious system, to lend his considerable weight for its consideration. And so people reject Jesus and they think they're rejecting religion. That's not the case at all. Jesus didn't come to bring a new religion. He came to end religion. The point of verses 4 and 5 of this text were that Jesus would not be a priest under the old system. He says, now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Jesus never, think about it, this was kind of interesting to me, it's the first time I've really seen it in this light. In all of Jesus' ministry, In all of Jesus' ministry, Jesus never entered the temple with the idea that he would perform any activity of a priest. Never. Why? He wasn't a priest after that order. And he didn't come to prop up this system. He came to tear it down. Any idea that we relate to God through our own work, Jesus came to disassemble that in entirety. He never tried to be a priest under the old system. He didn't try to conduct any of their religious rituals in mediating for others. He would come as a priest after a different order, and he would offer the temple of his body up for sacrificial destruction. So Jesus didn't come to perpetuate a system. He would completely fulfill it. And when you're sharing with your lost friends, when you're trying to bring the gospel to bear in the life of of unsaved people that you work with, neighbors and friends and coworkers and people you play softball with, you've got to be absolutely clear with them that to reject Jesus is not to reject another religious system. To reject Jesus is to reject rest. Can you see the difference? I think sometimes, I think sometimes we just don't know what we're doing when we share the gospel with people. And what I, what I mean by that is that we're not showing the radical difference between faith in Christ and some system of making ourselves right with God through effort. We're not doing a good enough job at showing the radical dividing line of helping them to understand that Jesus didn't come to prop up a system. He didn't come to endorse a standard. He came to lay himself down so that we could be accepted through his sacrifice. He didn't perpetuate a system, he fulfilled it. And by fulfilling it, he made it obsolete. Jesus himself would now embody the way. He even said he was, right? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is why it's accurate, if not a little trite, to say that Christianity is not A religion at all, it's a relationship. That really is accurate. Uh -uh, It's a little trite, but it's accurate. It's nearness with God through Jesus Christ. It's unity with the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Living in community with Him, that's relationship. In closing, I want to ask you to ask one simple question 
asked in a few different ways. I want you to consider this question this week. In what way, in what way are you perpetuating the old system of atonement in your life? In what way are you perpetuating the old system of trying to do enough good to make up for the bad? In the way you relate to any of the people in your life. And of course, if you're trying to relate to God that way. In what way are you perpetuating that old system? What person or group of people are you trying to atone for your sins with? In what way are you trying to atone for your sins with God? As you try to answer this question, I want you to do one simple thing. As you try to answer that question, do this one thing. Look up and see Jesus seated. Seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Let's pray.